we've surveyed a number of New Testament motifs for characterizing Christ's atonement. Sacrifice, the suffering servant of the Lord, divine justice, uh, representation. And today we come to a final motif, redemption. Now, although there are many other elements or motifs in the New Testament used to characterize the atonement, our time permits us to deal with just one last motif, and that is the motif of redemption. What do we mean by redemption? In the ancient world, the notion of redemption had to do with the buying back of prisoners of war or with the buying of slaves out of slavery. And the payment that was given to redeem these persons, uh, to liberate them, was called a ransom. Now, already in the Old Testament, you have this ransom motif present. Certain Old Testament sacrifices might have a ransom substituted for them. So that instead of offering an animal in sacrifice, one might bring a ransom payment that could serve as a means of atonement. Similarly, in the Old Testament, uh, God is referred to as Israel's redeemer because he redeems Israel out of bondage and liberates his people. The difference here is that God doesn't need to pay a ransom in order to redeem people. Now, God's great redemptive act in the Old Testament would be the Exodus, which is signaled by the Passover sacrifice and feast. Now, when we move to the New Testament, we've already seen in Mark 10.45 that Jesus characterizes his mission as giving his life as a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. His life served as a payment for our liberation from the captivity of sin. Similarly, other New Testament authors did not think that Christ's uh, redeeming act was costless. Rather, there was a price that was paid for our redemption. For example, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 to 18 says, You were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish. 1 Peter 1, 17 to 18. Similarly, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, Ephesians 1, 7. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 says that Christ offered his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So Paul could remind his Corinthian readers, you were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20, 1 Corinthians 6.20, and that price was, as we've seen, the blood of Christ which was paid to redeem us from the captivity of sin. You'll remember that at Jesus' last supper, he characterizes his sacrificial death as inaugurating a new covenant, the new covenant that was predicted by the prophet Jeremiah. Well, similarly, the author of the book of Hebrews um, thinks of Jesus' redemptive death as inaugurating a new covenant and the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 says, He is the mediator of a new covenant since a death has occurred which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. Hebrews 9.15. So Hebrews agrees with the Gospels in regarding Jesus' uh, death as a redemptive sacrifice that inaugurates a new covenant. In the book of Revelation, 
chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, John has a vision of Christ as the sacrificial lamb who redeemed by his death um, mankind. John, uh, Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. Worthy art thou to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain, and by thy blood didst ransom men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Notice here that the author describes Christ as a sacrificial lamb which has been slaughtered and his blood ransoms for God people from all around the world and constitutes them now as a kingdom and priests serving God. And this is the fulfillment of the frustrated intention of the old covenant, the first covenant. According to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6, the intent of the Old Covenant was precisely this. Exodus 19.6 says, You shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. But of course, with the apostasy and judgment that fell upon Israel, that intention was shattered and frustrated. But now, in the vision of the sacrificial lamb who gives his life to ransom people for God from every tribe and tongue and nation and people and constitutes them as a priestly kingdom, uh, that intention is finally fulfilled. All right. Any adequate theory of the atonement, if it's to commend itself to us as a Christian theory of the atonement, has to make peace with the biblical data that we've reviewed. Specifically, it has to take account of Christ's death as a sacrificial offering that expiates sin and propitiates God's wrath. It needs to take account of Christ's role as the suffering servant of the Lord who is substitutionarily punished for the sins of others. It needs to take account of divine justice and how Christ's death satisfies the demands of God's justice, leading to our acquittal and being declared righteous before him. It needs to account for Christ's role as a substitute and representative on our behalf before God so that we are punished for our sins in our substitute, in our representative, thereby satisfying the demands of God's justice. And finally, it needs to take account of Christ's blood and sacrificial death as a ransom that redeems and liberates us from sin and its consequences. So as we turn now to a systematic summary of the doctrine of the atonement, I think we would do well to keep in mind the admonition of the New Testament scholar William Farmer. He said, some exegetes appear to think of Christian doctrine as having come into being largely through church councils later in the history of the church. The truth is that Christian doctrine begins with biblical texts and with the earliest interpretations of these texts, which we find in the New Testament itself. Any comment or discussion or question then on this review or survey of the manifold biblical data concerning Christ's atonement? Yes. Going back to uh, Christ doesn't require, I mean, God doesn't require in the Old Testament, but I. I always thought that the slaying of the firstborn, the only hope, the future hope of Egypt, was what was symbolic of Christ dying. And that's what that was part of the release uh -huh. as well. Well, now, I, I think Jesus does think of himself 
in the Last Supper as the Passover sacrifice, John the Baptist in John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and Paul presents Christ as a Passover sacrifice. But I don't think it would be right to say the firstborn of Egypt who fell under the judgment of God are a type of Christ. I don't see that anywhere in the um, scripture, though it is certainly true that a doctrine of substitutionary atonement would say that Christ did bear the judgment and the penalty for our sin so that we don't have to bear it. But that the firstborn of Egypt, for example, didn't bear substitutionally the punishment due to the people of Israel for their sins. They, they just fell under the wrath of God for their own sins. Right. The, uh, I, I see that. I was seeing more of, of like when Isaac was to be offered, it's like God's asking you to give up hope in yourself. The Egyptians have to, because God's working with everybody. You give up hope in yourself and take the new hope, which Christ is going to mm -hmm. show when he arises. Well, it's certainly correct to say that Isaac is a type of Christ. The book of Hebrews makes that clear, that in the sacrifice of his only beloved son as a sin offering, interestingly enough, Abraham typifies the sacrifice of Jesus as God's only beloved son offered as a sacrifice for our sins. So that connection, I think, is clear and explicit. Bobby? Hey, Dr. Craig. I'm trying to find a good way to phrase this question. So I'm trying to, I think it would be fascinating or really interesting to see how those that hold heretical views of Christ, of who Christ is, his two natures, both fully man and fully God, how would they make sense of Christ's atoning death? It seems like if you deny both his full humanity and his full deity, it renders any of these motifs or our basic yes. understanding of atonement as meaningless. Excellent and question. Is Christ's divinity essential to the efficacy of his atoning work? Is what Bobby's asking. And the typical Orthodox view is yes, absolutely, that no human being, no mere mortal, could have offered sufficient atonement for the sins of mankind, and therefore the divinity of Christ is essential. I don't know what sort of doctrine of the atonement ancient heretics may have had, but if we look at the modern period, Bobby, since the Enlightenment, when theologians began to give up the divinity of Christ, we'll see that what they turned to was typically moral influence theories, uh, where Christ is simply an example to us of someone who was obedient unto death, who was devoted entirely to God, whose consciousness was dominated by God, um, or who lived a life of meaning and value even in the face of his own death, and therefore we can do likewise and imitate him, as it were. But it's certainly not going to do justice to these um, biblical motifs right. that we've talked about. Thanks. Eric. So um, one sort of niggling question I've always had in my back of my mind about the doctrine of substitutionary atonement is the idea that um, Jesus is taking the penalty of our sins, which is death, ultimately separation from God. Now, for us, that penalty would be permanent. But for Jesus, both types of death are only temporary. So how can we say that he took the full extent of our penalty when our penalty would have been greater? Now, this isn't a question about the biblical data. This is a question about the coherence of the doctrine of the atonement. It's, a, it's an objection that we'll see was raised um, by Faustus Socinus to the reformer's doctrine of the atonement, and we'll, go, we'll discuss this uh, later on. So I'm going to put off that question until we get to that part in our class. Bruce? Well, it seems like uh, the uh, answer is in Hebrews 2.9, where he says he tasted death for everyone, so only, only a being that existed for all time could suffer for everyone for all time in a moment of time. You're responding Pursu to Bobby's question about the need for the divinity of yes, Christ? Is yes, that, yeah. ge that general. Okay. 
was also my my uh, dual or the second question or point I had was in understanding um, how a someone that did deny his Jesus's full humanity and full deity if he wasn't fully human again that's just the problems that entail are that that unfold right that would be a gnostic mm-hmm. view wouldn't it right. that, if it deny the full die. humanity right. of Christ right and so far as I know, the Gnostics did not have a, a serious doctrine of um, the death of Christ or his suffering because he wasn't fully human. Indeed, for them, divinity could not suffer the pains of material bodily experience. So you're quite right, I think, in saying that the essential humanity of Christ as well as his divinity is um, vital to a robust Christian biblical doctrine of the atonement. One just doesn't find these Gnostic views of the atonement in modern theology very much, perhaps in aberrant movements like the New Age movement, for example, um, or these alternative, alternative spiritualities, a sort of quasi-pantheistic Buddhist view of Jesus, you might have um, this more Gnostic doctrine. But these are not very important in Christian theology, which focus or would de- deny more the deity of Christ than his humanity. I'm using the word Christian. They're obviously in a very broad sense, in the sense that these folks would teach at divinity schools that were founded as Christian institutions and would identify themselves as Christians. Yes, Don? Um, Mine is more a comment than a question, but to say that Christ was fully human means you've laid on him, have you not, the sin nature, which he did not have. Well, now think about this, Don. The sin nature cannot be essential to humanity. Otherwise, you'd have to say that Adam and Eve, prior to the fall, were not human beings because they they didn't have a sin nature. And that's preposterous. They, They were obviously human beings. So the sin nature is something that affects all people. It's universal, but it's not essential to humanity. Otherwise, Adam and Eve were subhuman. Um, prior to the fall. Well, correct me if I'm mistaken, but to say that Adam and Eve didn't have the sin nature, basically... Prior to the fall. uh, Prior to the fall. The basic comment by God was, don't eat of the fruit of that tree, for in the day you do, you will die. Surely die. And that was argued by the enemy, but... Beyond that, up to that point in time when they've actually ate of the fruit of the tree, I don't think they were human as we understand a human. They didn't have the capacity to die without eating of the fruit of the tree first. Well, Did they? now, wait a minute. The capacity to die, mortality, is also surely not essential to being a human being. Otherwise, the blessed in heaven are not human. And that's surely not correct. That we, We're not going to cease to be human beings. You're associating sin and its effects as somehow essential to being a human being. And that's not the biblical view. The biblical view is that man prior to the fall was neither mortal nor sinful um, and that Jesus was neither uh, sinful uh, in his um, in his nature. So, it, and in the blessed in heaven are not going to be mortal, and I don't think they'll have a sin nature either. So, the presence of a sin nature and corruption and so forth is universal, but that's not the same as being essential. Let, let me just give an illustration if this isn't communicating. Prior to around 1968, It was universal among human beings that no one had walked on the surface of the moon. There was nobody who had the property prior to 1968 of having walked on the surface of the moon. Does that mean that that's an essential property? 
to human beings? Well, no, it was a universal property, but not an essential property. Uh, Neil Armstrong and others flew to the moon and walked on the moon and had that property. So similarly, sin can be a universal property of human beings, but it's not essential to us, lest you deny the humanity of Adam and Eve and deny the humanity of Jesus and the blessed in heaven. No, I, I do not deny the humanity of Jesus. I object to the use of the word fully. All right. Now, I would prefer me, truly. Okay. If, yeah, that, well, and, and I've already responded to that. Let me just say, I don't think you should use the word fully because that's misleading. What you should use is the word truly. He was truly God and truly man. Um, but if you use the word fully, that makes it sound like, well, he was 100% man, in which case he wasn't God. Or if he's 100% God, he wasn't man. The creeds that we've studied already in looking at the Trinity and the two natures of Christ was that Christ is vera Deus, vera homo. He's truly God, truly man. He has all the essential properties of humanity and all the essential properties of deity. Uh, and that doesn't entail mortality and sin. Bob? Yes, I would support Don. I do not believe... Oh, Bob, come on! Wait a minute. <laughs> you can't, you can't! I do not believe that Christ was 100% human. No, no, For well, two, I, I already spoke okay, to that, good, but don't good. you think he For was two truly reasons, human? reasons, and I want to bring... One, he, he did not have the capacity for sin capacity for sin. Two, he could look you in the eye and forgive your sins. No human can do that. So I don't believe he was 100% human. Well, then wait. Now, don't say 100%. That's, right. okay. that's just what I've nor spoken do, against. You. Nor is there a requirement in God's mind that I can find for him to be 100% human. Whatever percent human he was was adequate for him to save me, and thank God for that. Well, can you show me a biblical passage? See, Bobby could, asked about how do heretics uh, <laughs> understand yes, the atonement. I, I mean, it, our defenders by that, by, the, by, that measure, by that measure, I'm a heretic because I don't believe, and I would ask those who disagree to explain those two points. He did not have the capacity for sin, and he had the ability to forgive sin. What human could do that? He, he has that ability in virtue of being divine. He had two natures, Bob, one human and one divine. Right. And his ability to forgive sin, for example, is a property he has in virtue of his deity, in virtue of his, his divine nature. He has two natures. But we, we mustn't say that because um, he lacked capacities that a merely human being would have, that therefore he wasn't truly human. A merely human being couldn't be omniscient, right? For example, a merely right. human being couldn't be omnipotent. Right. But Christ could because he was truly God as well as truly man. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you, if you deny the true humanity of Christ, you got to then go back to our discussion about Apollinarius and why the church fathers rejected this that if he hasn't truly taken our human nature, then he hasn't redeemed human nature. And his redemption, his atonement is Well, in I vain. won't object to truly, because that's suitably vague, but I would have to object to 100%. Well, no, say... no creed is affirmed 100%. Yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> OK, who's next? Tell you what, our next, our next heretic. <laughs> OK. Uh, Dr. Craig, uh, uh, John 14, um, 12, it says that um, the work that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Now, in our identification with Christ, how much of that greater work is a substitutional, um, oh. you know, taking up the burden for another? And, and to what extent should that be drawn uh, in our identification with Christ? Now, I feel absolutely certain, Taiwan, 
that this passage read in context isn't referring to Christ's work of the atonement. When we talk about the person of Christ and the work of Christ, and we speak of the atonement as Christ's work, this isn't biblical language. These are theological categories that are used to explain scripture. When Christ is talking about his works, he's talking not about his substitutionary atonement. For example, he says in the previous verse, um, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He's probably talking about the miraculous signs that he did. And if you don't believe me on my own word, believe me for the sake of these works, which are signs of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Uh, his healings and exorcisms, for example. So it might be that he's talking here about miraculous works that people would do or maybe great works of evangelism uh, in bringing people to a saving knowledge of God. But I feel confident that he's not suggesting that you and I will offer our lives as a substitutionary atonement for others, that we're going to have a greater sacrifice than him because his atonement is all sufficient and final. Remember in the book of Hebrews it says it's once for all and therefore never need be repeated. Um, because love is actually defined by sacrifice. If we love we cannot escape uh, making sacrifices. And um, if you Take away sacrifice, then love is empty. So um, the work of God is to believe that um, He is uh, that that He is sent by God. Okay, so that there is a channel between man and God opened up by Jesus Christ, and we can, as Jacob Ladder says, we can. Um, approach God through this ladder. And if we have that uh, channel of communication and know God's will for, like, all the missionary kind of understand that if you want to redeem a group, uh, a people group, you have to make some kind of sacrifice to, to bring them back into Christ's um, sal salvation. Yes. And so there's always, and, and I think, um, I think um, Christ talk about the work um, is basically what Heavenly Father revealed to each individual what he want them mm -hmm. to do and whether we submit into it or not. And to some extent, there is, there definitely is a sacrifice, and to yeah. some extent, there is some substitutional, um, you know, suffering. burden. Yes, burden suffering. And, yes. And I, I want to affirm that too, Taiwan. I mean, I think what you're saying is obviously correct, even if it's not based on this verse. Paul says in his epistles, "Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." And complete the suffering of Christ. Yes, Paul talks about how in his ministry and suffering, persecution, he's going to, I mean, this is so, language that I still can't understand, but he says, I'm going to complete what is lacking in Christ's suffering by my own bodily suffering for the, the gospel. So that's certainly true, even if it's not based on this verse, that as agents of Christ and the kingdom, we need to be involved in service for others and sacrifice that may entail suffering. Any other comment on the biblical data? George. Uh, Bill, to bring this conversation back to earth, um, <laughs> I mentioned to you an article this morning that I thought uh, the class would like to get your reaction to. Um, yes, I thought that would have been more appropriately brought up when we were talking about heretics. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, there was an article in a local paper uh, about two weeks ago. In fact, Leanne pointed it out to me, and I was astounded at what it said. Uh, there has been an Episcopal church in the Atlanta area for many years called the Episcopal Church of the Atonement. And uh, it's on High Point Road in 
Buckhead or Sandy Springs. Anyway, the church had dwindled in uh, attendance, so they brought in a team to troubleshoot, including a professor of church leadership from Candler School of Theology at Emory, who's ordained as an Episcopal priest. So the conclusion was they needed to rebrand the church or rename the church because the word atonement is offensive. And not just the word, but the doctrine is offensive. And I gave you the article, and I was amazed at that, and I'd like to get your reaction. Yes, I'm anxious to read the article, but what George points out here is so typical of the old mainline denominations. They are embarrassed and offended at the doctrine of the atonement, and therefore are quite willing to abandon it in the misguided belief that this is somehow going to increase church attendance by moving away from orthodoxy. In fact, it's going to have, I predict, exactly the opposite effect. It is the churches which have stayed true to biblical orthodoxy, biblical doctrine and preaching that are the growing churches, and it is the mainline old denominations that increasingly depart from biblical Christianity that find themselves uh, now bleeding members and uh, declining in, in the roles. The objection here to the atonement saying that it's a dark doctrine is that it smacks of child abuse. God is a, like a cosmic tyrant who abuses his uh, son, Jesus. Uh, and this is simply a caricature of not only the biblical doctrine of the atonement, which says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, but also, as we'll see, when we do our survey of church history, it's a caricature of traditional theories of the atonement that have been defended by theologians down through history. They always see the atonement as motivated by God's love. It is God's redeeming act, which Christ voluntarily undertakes for the sake of our salvation. And I think that it is a glorious doctrine myself, I'm motivated by the love of God and extolling God's holiness and goodness, and um, therefore nothing to be ashamed of, uh, much less to be abandoned. Many of the modern hymnals are now refer are expunging all references to the blood and the atonement. Is that true? In I the, wasn't aware hymns. of that. Yes. And many of these, well, let, let's hang on. Uh, many of these reservations about the atonement are going to be based upon uh, objections that the doctrine is immoral or unjust. And this is a serious objection, a formidable objection that needs to be dealt with straightforwardly. And we are going to tackle that objection um, in this class and look at this challenge and see if this is, in fact, a, an immoral and unjust doctrine. Well, let me conclude this morning by uh, saying a few words by way of introduction to our survey of different atonement theories that have been offered down through history. We've seen that the church fathers, for the first several hundred years, were embroiled in disputes over the person of Christ. There were first the Trinitarian controversies, and then these were followed by the Christological controversies as the doctrines of the Trinity and the two natures of Christ were hammered out and articulated. And therefore, the fathers had little time to devote to the discussion of what later theologians were to call the work of Christ, that is to say, his achieving atonement. As a result of this, no ecumenical council ever pronounced on the subject of the atonement. And this has left the church without conciliar guidance. There is no church council like we have with Nicaea or Chalcedon, which has pronounced upon the doctrine of the atonement. Um, and that has left the church somewhat tetherless um, in its articulation and understanding of the atonement. Now, when the church fathers did mention the subject of the atonement, their comments tended to be very brief and, frankly, for the most part, unincisive. They did not have 
a profound grasp of the subject. Now, the church fathers thought of Christ's death as a sacrificial offering. And sometimes it was construed in terms of substitutionary punishment. Let me read for you a statement by the great church historian Eusebius from his um, treatise on the demonstration of the gospel. This is what Eusebius wrote. The Lamb of God was chastised on our behalf and suffered a penalty he did not owe but which we owed because of the multitude of our sins. And so he became the cause of the forgiveness of our sins because he received death for us and transferred to himself the scourging, the insults, and the dishonor which were due to us and drew down upon himself the apportioned curse, being made a curse for us. And what is that but the price of our souls? And so the oracle says in our person, by his stripes we are healed, and the Lord delivered him for our sins. And similar sentiments were expressed by Oregon, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, John Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, and so forth. Now, notice that Eusebius sees Christ's vicarious punishment as the price paid for our salvation. He says, what was that but the price of our souls? In saying this, he draws attention to the ransom which was paid as the price for our redemption. And the church fathers tended to fasten upon this motif, the motif of ransom, uh, to the neglect of the other New Testament motifs in their understanding of the doctrine of the atonement. So, the next time that we meet, we will talk about the Church Fathers' ransom theory, or as it's sometimes called, the Christus Victor theory. But uh, until we meet again, I do want to wish you all a uh, happy Easter and uh, hope that the Easter celebration will be one of uh, deep meaning to all of us as we celebrate not only the Lord's death, but his resurrection and eternal life. Let's close with uh, benediction. And now may the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself as an offering for our sins to redeem us to eternal life and fellowship with God, and who rose gloriously from the dead, breaking the bonds of sin and death and hell, fill you with his joy and his life unto life eternal. Amen.